I think we should study religions and see, because they've had thousands of years to hone their yes. designs to, to be, you know, to compete in a difficult market. They're now failing completely. And I think it's because of the information revolution, is that they were all designed to work basically in, in murky water, where, where, where people couldn't see outside. And now they have to work in translucent, transparent water, and it's much, much harder. But they still have, there's a lot of design wisdom in how they evolved over time. And, and, but in particular, there's one thing that they have done, and they've done a very good job of it, compared with everything else, and that is um, sort of summed up in uh, the line from the Robert Frost poem. Home is where when you have to go there, they have to take you in. Uh, there's no secular institutions of which that's true. And there are a lot of people that don't have a home. Mm -hmm. And if we could create secular institutions that had as their motto, no matter how down and out you are, no matter how little you can contribute to the pleasure of the group. That's the hard one. That's why book clubs, you know, you know the illiterate are not welcome. Uh, if, if, if there was some understanding, some tradition of a place where when you were really at the absolute so bottom. Very interesting, Dan, because there's very good social science that shows that all over the world there's a very strong correlation between religiosity and church attendance and income inequality and social. the lack of a social safety net. Yeah, absolutely. And it is very um, regular in yeah, yeah, sub yeah. subgroups of various countries which share cultures in common but differ on these two dimensions. They always go together. And of course, the reason why you mean the, more the United States, the less yes, uh, the reason social. the United States is so much more religious than the other countries of Western Europe with whom we share a culture is because we have the greatest income inequality yeah. and the weakest social safety net. There is something, I guess Nick and I talked about it in the car ride over, but you know, there is something, one of the parts of the religious experience is dealing with what you would call with various contentious words, transcendent, sacred, spiritual, you know, ineffable, uh, parts of the, you know, things that in our contemporary vocabulary tend to go along with supernatural beliefs but maybe don't necessarily have to. And then we can argue about, on the political level, what is the most clear word to use about it. But, um, but we become, as naturalists, a little bit afraid of using those words. I mean, we, we would certainly get a little nervous if someone said, we're gonna start talking in public schools about anything transcendent at all, right? Uh, but, then, but then I'm completely sympathetic with the idea that that's part of why, um, you know, just giving people health care is not enough to give them fulfillment. Or work in Europe. I mean, the Europeans don't have this spirituality to replace religion. They don't have book clubs, I mean, any institution, and yet they've become completely secular in the last 200 years. Right, but, but they suffer with this enemy that uh, Dan well, is pointing Well, I think, I'm just saying that I don't think, I think the enemy needs to be cured, can't be cured in the short term, it needs to be cured in the long term by societal restructuring. There are groups, particularly in my experience in New York, which is, you know, an unusual place, it's not very representative, but there are all of these science clubs cropping up. And what's very interesting, um, there's, you know, there's Lucid, Secret Science Club, there's, um, a nerd night, and, and what's interesting, and a lot of them appeal to very young people, they call it brains and beer. Um, one of the interesting aspects is that it's very social. It's not just walking into a theater, seeing a play, and turning around and walking out. Um, a lot of the success of all of those isn't just, okay, here's a common theme that people are coming together on an intellectual topic about usually, I mean, all of them that I know of are science um, topics of different varieties. So they're finding a community of like-minded people in which to explore ideas. They're feeling, you know, connected. They're feeling smarter. They're feeling like they're improving themselves. But the social aspect is crucial to their success. They get to hang out and drink and talk. And I think it's one of those things that's just cropping up naturally that you're describing. When America turned against drinking, when, when, the, when the campaign against drinking and driving hit North America, uh, I think it had a profound effect on the nature of the way people could form communities, right? This is, a, this is a culture in which, generally speaking, you can't, unlike in most of Europe, walk to the neighborhood pub. Uh, right? Most people are driving distance from everything, everywhere they might socialize. Now you've made it very, very inconvenient. I mean, 
uh, you know, bars went, bars went, went under, not in New York City, where people, right? N not where, where you had a European type, uh, a, a, a form of, so of urban organization and spatial organization, more like Europe, but in, but in Kansas and Oklahoma and Alabama and, uh, and, and rural Ontario and so bars just went under. They couldn't, they couldn't be sustained because people had to drive to them. And once you couldn't drink and drive, there was no way for, but so, so uh, and, you know, there were small communities in Ontario, which in the 70s were quite secular, and by the 90s had, had seen a resurgence of religion, uh, and also the closure of their bars. Well, I don't think this is a coincidence, right? I'd seek God too. <laughs> Those are both interesting points, and you know, I live in New York as well, and I think that that's why there's that con congruence. I mean, I go to some of these science clubs, by the way, there's also an enormous number of philosophy meetups and clubs in New York. Some of which, you know, my colleagues tell me, oh, it's very difficult to get philosophy, people interested in philosophy. Bullshit. I get 1,200 people on my meetup group that meets once a month, and it's not the largest in New York. But people can do that, partly because, of course, the variety, cultural variety of New York, but also part because there are constantly places where you can gather, where you can meet, and you can e reach easily, and so on and so forth. So, so the infrastructure is important. When I was in Knoxville, Tennessee, the hell I could do that sort of stuff. Um, you know, the, 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 the ridiculous thing at some point was that the local newspaper featured, um, you know, seven interesting things to do every night in, in Knoxville. And on Sunday night, the most interesting place to be in Knoxville was my basement because I was hosting a book club. There was no way in hell that would ever happen in Europe or in New York City, okay? But in Knoxville, Tennessee, that was it. Why? People don't have that sense of intellectual community. People don't have, can't, they have to drive everywhere. You can't walk anywhere. There's no public transportation and so on and so forth. So, so to some extent, it's the making the availability of these venues, uh, but also it's a matter of the basic infrastructure of society. If you don't, and that's why Europe is a, largely a very different place than most of the United States.